I never told the story to anyone, and I don't really intend to tell it again. I have a pounding migraine today, and this thread has kept me good company as I drifted in and out. I actually don't like talking about this time in my life. When I was around 12, I lived with my mom. We were below the poor level. We lived up in the mountains around Santa Cruz, California. My mom had a friend that owned a large bit of property up there, and he let us stay in a trailer up there. Our trailer was very small and was right beside a garden. A chain link fence ran around the garden to keep the dog the owner had out, along with other animals. All kinds of deer and things are very common in the area. Also, along the fence area was a single room. It was like a tiny house, but it was only a single room on the inside. This room had light, and since our actual trailer didn't, I spent a lot of my time in there. By the way, sorry that the story will be fairly long. I'm actually pretty bad at writing. I just want to say that first, as this will be the only time. So there's this one thing you should know right now. This small fenced in area was only a small part of the property, but most of it was just a bunch of woods. Also, I refused to leave the fence area because the owner's dog had been mistreated by children in the past and was very sketchy towards me all the time. If I was alone, it would try to bite at me, even through the fence. The fence was tall, at least seven feet high and wasn't even movable. So as long as the gate was closed, I was safe. With that being said, there is no one else around us for miles and miles. Now I'm telling you all this because I think it's important that you understand what kind of scene this was before I really get into the story. So we have a fenced in location that seems fairly safe. It contains a trailer and a single room with power that is not connected to the trailer. Nothing else around for miles. My mom's van is parked out in front of the gate to the fenced in area, and a single unpaved road runs from this garden for about a mile to the main house. Now then, I would bring friends up there to sleep over here and there. We all thought it was pretty cool, you know. Besides, we would get our own room to stay in to play video games all night long. It was like a dream come true. The only downside was simple. When it would get dark outside, it would get really dark. No city around, and the trailer would not be lit up. There was no bathroom to use in the room, and you would have to walk through the dark garden in order to get to the trailer to use it. Strange things would happen out here from time to time. It was always something that could be somewhat easily explained away though. Noises like people working at night. Or once me and a friend were sitting out in the garden and we saw a shadow as big as a small bear bound up a tree. But the tree didn't shake like there was weight on it. The dog also creeped me out. But you know, angry dog. And I was a kid. It happens. Now, I do get scared pretty fast. I always been that way. For example, I have trouble walking through a lit house if I'm alone. My friends, however, tend to be more outgoing. Just the kinds of people I get along with. This time, I had a friend over. His name was Jacob. We were staying up all night and playing Sonic the Hedgehog 3 on my Sega Genesis. We started playing as the sun went down and by the time we were finishing up the game, it was around 2 a.m. That's when we heard it. We turned off the game getting ready to find something else to play. There was a rumbling in the woods behind the room we were in. Like somebody was rolling something really heavy around. We hadn't heard it before. Because the noise from what we were playing was loud. I immediately got goosebumps. Jacob was not really worried about it. But it's not like there was someone else's house a yard right over there. It was just a forest for miles. And it sounded like someone was constructing something or some shit. Dragging and rolling something really heavy. Eventually, Jacob convinced me to just play some more games. 
I agreed on the condition that we turned the volume down so we could hear if something happened. We started playing, and I didn't even notice that the noise had stopped because I was into the game. A couple hours later, Jacob said he had to use the bathroom. I was feeling fine by then, so I was fine when he left to the trailer to relieve himself. He was taking a while, so eventually, I decided I was going to go check on him. Besides, I could use the bathroom and grab a snack while I was at it. I got up and opened the door to leave. And when I opened it, he was just standing at the doorway. Right outside the door, facing it. It scared the shit out of me. That's when I asked what he was doing. And he just stood there, blocking the exit. I realized he must have sneaked up to the door because I could hear him walk away from the room. But I hadn't heard him walk back up to it. It was super quiet out there, without the noises of the city. I should have been able to hear. But he refused to say anything or respond. He just stood there. I told him he was really creeping me out. But it wasn't like him to try to scare me like this. Finally, I decided to just go to the trailer and use the bathroom myself. I told him what I was going to do. Then I moved past him, but when I pushed him out of my way a little, his skin felt freezing to the touch. I jumped a little, but it was a cold night and he had been standing out there for like 30 minutes, so I figured that was to be expected. I walked as quickly as I could over to the trailer. And that's when he followed me, like, right on my tail. It was unnerving. I joked a little, saying that he already surprised me by scaring me at the door. The joke is over already. Finally, I got to the trailer and walked in. He didn't follow. He just stayed at the doorway. Now, I want you to picture this. Imagine inside a trailer with the door open in the middle of the night and your friend is just standing outside a trailer looking in. I checked on my mom who was fast asleep. Then I turned to go into the bathroom. It was a portal potty and we keep the bathroom door shut because it smells bad. When I reached for the door and tried to open it though, it was locked. That's when I heard a nervous voice come from behind the door. Um in here. I quickly turned to look at Jacob, but the door was still open and there was nothing there but pitch black night. I froze. I would have heard the bathroom door open if he had come in behind me and gone that way. There is no way to do it quietly. That's when I just yelled out so loud that my mom woke up. I stared at the doorway unable to bring myself to move a muscle. She got up, walked over there, and looked out. Not seeing anything, she closed the door and asked me what was wrong. By now, Jacob was coming out of the bathroom and acting perfectly normal, but just a little bit confused. I explained what happened, and Jacob said he was just taking a long time in the bathroom, basically. None of them believed me at all, no matter how much I insist. My mom is sure that I just got sleepy and imagined it. Jacob thought I was trying to prank him. So my mom gets out a big flashlight and walks us back to the room. She tells us to go to sleep. Then she leaves and goes back to the bed herself. Now, this room doesn't have any windows or anything. So after a while, I calm back down a little bit. I'm telling myself that my mom was right. It must have been like a waking dream or something. Meanwhile, Jacob insists that he was in the bathroom the whole time, and I'm inclined to believe him, because there is just no way to really get around without being heard. So I settled down, but I'm a little rattled, but I'm thinking that I can just sleep it off throughout the night. Suddenly, the dog starts going nuts, right behind us. The room is up against the fence. So the dog must have been like right behind the room on the other side. I guess when the dog started going nuts I got scared because Jacob started laughing at me and said 
the dog barking at a squirrel or some shit and you're over here shitting yourself it keeps going like that for a long time though suddenly the barking stops and gets replaced by whimpering we hear the dog run away there's about 45 seconds of silence before we hear something new a small stretching sound on the back wall of the room we both try to be silent as we can eventually it stops after five or so minutes of silence Jacob decides to be brave he decides that he's gonna wake up my mom to tell her something crazy is going on I wish he wouldn't leave me alone but there's absolutely no way I'm gonna go out there he arms himself as best as he can with a tennis racket we had in the room with us then he takes a couple small steps and opens the door and dashes out I close it as quick as I can behind him in less than 30 seconds I hear a scream not long after the door flies open and he comes back in looking pale as a ghost he looks tired and his breathing is like he just ran a marathon his eyes look as big as dinner plates I then ask what is going on like four times before he finally starts getting words out. He tells me he walked out there and he was walking through the garden as quick as he could and then he saw my mom just standing there. He tried to talk to her but she stared at him with a blank expression. Getting super creeped out because of what happened to me earlier. He took a couple more steps towards her telling her that he thought something was in the woods. Suddenly. Her face turned to an awkward smile. Then he realized something terrible. He hadn't noticed sooner because of the darkness. She was on the other side of the fence. Now, the door to this room does not lock. And as I explained earlier, this room had no windows. As he is telling me what happened, he is also at the same time putting stuff in front of the door. And by the end, I was helping him. In retrospect, whatever was harassing us seemed to not want to actually enter the room or the trailer because the Jacob one didn't come into the room or to the trailer itself. Either way, we stacked everything we could against the door, thinking somehow, like in cartoons, this would actually definitely keep the creature out. So for the rest of the night, we heard scratches coming from all around the room. I, of course, ended up crying. Jacob looked like his mind had left his body with fear. At one point, whatever was out there was speaking as well. I heard it from right next to me where I was resting against the wall. In my mother's low voice. The same exact phrasing she had used earlier in the night. What's, What's wrong? wrong? Followed by... Go to sleep. The sun must have come up eventually. The scratching as well stopped. We heard my mom come to get us. This time, we actually heard footsteps. We of course refused to leave the room. My mom had to go get the property owner and have him take the door off. When we saw that it was actually her, I burst into tears again. We never had any experiences like these again, and we eventually moved away but that one night still haunts me i still refuse to go out at night unless i'm with a bunch of people and i will never ever live in the woods again anyways i hope you all enjoy hearing about this as i probably won't tell the story again thanks for listening When I was 23, I had a security gig at a dairy farm in Ohio. It was a modest place, only holding a few dozen cows at any given time. My then co-worker, a 34-year-old recovering meth addict named Corey, had just been fired for letting a cow go missing on his watch. An offense that would get you fired in every sense of the word. For starters, Corey was insane. By the time we met, he was seriously addicted to all kinds of drugs. 
and it rendered him virtually schizophrenic. Long nights were spent with him during my training period. He would tell me about the CIA and how they were out to get him. He was convinced that they were broadcasting thoughts into his head and that they would stop at nothing to ruin his life. More than once, I would catch him glancing over his shoulder or peeking out of windows with a dumb look on his face, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever was following him. That's the type of person that Corey was. Each of our cows had an ear tag label with a number. At 8 p.m., they were each to be guided into their own respective stalls and locked in for the night. Padlocks became the norm after an incident with local kids a few years earlier. In the mornings, we would have to carry around a clipboard containing each lock combination and individually release each one. It was the most annoying way to start the day, but the cows were more secure that way. That's what made Corey's story so unbelievable. He had claimed that the previous night, cow number 29 had been locked away in her stall along with the others. He told us that the only thing out of the ordinary that night was a bat stuck in the rafters that he planned to deal with in the morning. In order for his claim to be true, an intruder would have unlocked the barn with a set of keys, unlocked 29th stall with the correct combination, then reset the locks and leave undetected. Either that or they picked up a 1600 pound animal and leaped through a window. Considering Corey's nasty habit of abandoning his duties in order to twitch and hallucinate in the corner, a small part of me believed that some two-bit thief might have been able to get one over him. My boss, however, a 50-year-old hothead, concluded that Corey must have been involved with the cow's disappearance and kicked them to the curb. With nobody else to fill his position, my boss had offered to pay me extra for each of his duties that I could complete until we received a new hire. Naturally, I agreed. I would be heading back to school in a few weeks and needed all the money I could get. My first night back at work began normally. Since I would now be doing the work of two security guards, I would arrive early to get a head start on Corey's checklist. I started out by sweeping out the barn. Farmhands tried to keep the TMR in a long pile just in front of the stall door so the cows could eat throughout the night but that shit practically painted the floor by the time I got there. Midway through, I noticed something reflective in the corner of the barn. I swept a loose bit of corn and hay over it to investigate. On the floor before me was a neon yellow ear tag and I picked it up to examine it. 29. Next to 29's ear tag were the skeletal remains of a bat. I guess that was just another thing that Corey never got around to dealing with. I swept up the bones along with the rest of the barn. By the time I finished it was already 8 p.m. I made my way out to the fields and one at a time I guided each cow to its assigned stall. I got through about 10 or so before I noticed something strange. Across the field, about 50 meters away from everything else and all the others, was a cow alone. It faced away from me, seemingly transfixed on a nearby cornfield. Seeing a cow on its own is nothing strange, as they sometimes need personal space the same way as people do. What was strange though, was the way that her tail stuck straight out from behind her, unwavering. She stood as if she were afraid to slip, with her feet planted far apart. Perhaps the strangest of all, her head appeared to be tilted at a 90 degree angle. I wasn't eager to tell my boss. They had already put down so many sick cows before, but losing two in the matter of a week might have been enough to send them over the edge. That's when I decided to save that cow for last as I continued to guide the rest of them inside for the night. Being in charge of twice the amount of cows I was used to was time consuming. It took me nearly an hour to round them up. By the time I locked number 36 for the night, it was 9 o'clock. I should have been making my rounds by then, especially given the circumstances. I just had that last cow to deal with. When contemplating how long it was going to take me to unlock each cow in the morning, I realized something that made my blood run cold. The only stall left empty was number 29. 
I shuffled to the field, and surely enough, she was there. She hadn't moved an inch since I started the process of moving them. I approached her slowly. It was surreal seeing a creature frozen in such an odd position. As I came up on her, I could hear a definite, but muffled, chittering. It was unlike any noise I had ever heard from a cow. What the fuck did you eat? I thought to myself. I whistled to the cow before approaching her to avoid scaring her. On a dime, the chittering ceased. The cow's left ear rose to face the sky and began to oscillate like the periscope of a submarine. I could tell that moving this one would be a challenge. I rubbed her back attempting to calm her down. Bonding is key when establishing any sort of relationship with an animal. I had never interacted with 29 before, so we were unfamiliar with each other. Her skin felt bizarre, like clay with hide draped over it. I walked around to see her face. Her eyes were peeled open, darting around. Her mouth hung open and drooped to the side. I examined her left ear, searching for a place to reinsert her tag, but there was no piercing. I strapped the halter to 29's mouth and began to lead her. It was like trying to uproot a tree with a bike chain. Each tug that I gave was useless. I began to put my weight into it, but still, no luck. When I say no luck, I don't mean that 29 wouldn't follow me. I mean that her body shows zero sign of being affected by my body weight whatsoever. Cows are strong creatures, but they're not made of stone. I was perplexed. After 15 minutes of this, I decided that it was useless to continue on with the clock ever ticking. I could no longer afford to neglect my rounds. I began to walk to the security post to collect my flashlight and get on with the night. I heard a slow trotting. I looked behind me to see that the cow had in fact moved. 29 was now facing me. Not so shy now, I wonder. I turned around and continued walking towards the gate. When I made it halfway through the field, I began to hear the trotting again. But this time, it was louder and much quicker. I smiled to myself. Wish I would have known to walk away sooner. Without turning to face the cow, I walked into the barn and began fumbling with 29's padlock. 3 left, 32 right, 23 left. As the lock clicked open, I heard the floorboards behind me creak. A slow, vocal noise turned to a sickly gurgle. I hope to God whatever you got isn't contagious, I said before spinning around. All color drained from my face as I was greeted with the sight of the eight foot tall beast standing before me on its hind legs. Its ears were flapping like a hummingbird's wings. Its head was cocked sideways with one eye focused on me. Its pupil seemed to grow and shrink as it scanned over my entire body. Its lower jaw slowly moved up and down as it began to vocalize again. It began to creep towards me. Its front legs were kicking as it attempted to keep balance, all the while making that same noise. I began to feel lightheaded. I grabbed 29's padlock and made a break for the door. That's when the cow began to stomp behind me. I began to hyperventilate as I sprinted. The rest of the cows were spooked, shaking and jumping around as well. I slammed the door shut and clasped the padlock. A sickening boom shook the entire wall of the barn as 29 began to claw at the door. Oh, oh, oh. The beast croaked before chittering once more. I backed away from the door slowly, its wooden frame bending and contorting at the sheer force behind it. Without another warning, I turned my back to the barn and ran to my car as 29 began wailing and pounding. I never ended up making any rounds that night. Instead, I started my car and left that fucking place in the rear view mirror. I didn't even tell my boss. In fact, I avoided several of his phone calls because I had nothing to say. I figure it would be best if I just quit the easy way. There are certain things in life that back you into corners. Silence forces your hand, you know. That's why I'm writing this now.
I still wanted my money. A few weeks later, just before making my two hour drive back to college, I stopped by the farm to pick up my final check. My boss wasn't in his office on Tuesdays, so I took advantage of the situation and granted myself access with the key that I had seen him kick under the rug once or twice. After snagging my check and a few Jolly Ranchers, I got in my car and slowly began to drive away. Out of the corner of my eye, a young farmhand standing in the grazing field caught my attention. I lowered my window and said, Hey kid, stay away from the night shift. But he didn't answer me, nor even look at me. He just continued to stare at the pile of bones before him. As I kept driving, I kept staring at him, and he wouldn't even move an inch. That's when something struck me as odd. His head was tilted sideways, similar to 29's head. I swear, I'm never going back to that farm again. I pulled into the bar parking lot and stopped the car. I sat there for a moment, letting the engine idle as I thought about what I was doing. I knew my wife and kids were at home waiting for me, but I just couldn't bear to face them right now. The thought of spending another evening with them, avoiding the elephant in the room, made me physically sick. I closed my eyes and cursed myself. Everything was going to shit. My wife was pregnant with our fourth child and I simply wasn't making enough money to support us. Over the past six months, our quality of life had slowly declined and it was becoming harder and harder to explain to the kids what was happening. My wife and I loved each other, but the financial difficulties sprouted endless arguments that could last late into the night. The truth was, I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen to us. I didn't know how to pull my family out of this terrifying nosedive. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't stop thinking about that day when we would be kicked out of our house. I started having trouble sleeping and my mood worsened. I would find myself snapping at the kids over little things. So instead of taking out my fear and frustrations on my family, I started to drink after work. At first, it was just a beer or two, something to take the edge off. But after a month, I began to stay late, drinking more and more. It was time that I needed to think. It was a few moments of peace. My wife hated my habit, and I didn't blame her. She never argued with me about it. But when I came home reeking of beer and whiskey, she would have this look, that look that said everything. I never really was a drinking man before I fell on hard times. Even in college, I never drank much. Never to the point of being seriously drunk. I just didn't see the point, but now, that my life was crumbling before my eyes. I found comfort in drinking. It was a space I could enter and push my thoughts to the edge of my tired mind. And tonight, I needed a drink. Before leaving work, my boss told me that they were conducting layoffs in the coming weeks. He didn't go into detail, but as I sat in my car, I realized that he was unofficially informing me that I would soon be jobless. I felt sick. What the hell am I going to do? How was I going to provide for my family? Growing up, I never expected this. Why would I? The thought of my kids made me terribly depressed. They depended on me. They looked up to me. How was I supposed to tell them daddy couldn't pay the bills? I pulled my car door open and forced my mind to settle. I licked my lip. I almost ran into the bar. Music droned somewhere above me as my eyes roamed around the room. 
neon beer signs line the walls and their colors trailed in the air as I sipped my six rum and coke. My head was floating above my shoulders and the conversation around me slurred and streaked like wet paint. I licked my lips and they felt bloated on my face. I blinked lazy and realized I was taking a heavy breath. I shifted on my bar stool and almost fell off. My mind exploded with dizziness and my stomach churned. How many beers had I had before starting the endless rum and cokes? I couldn't remember. The bar was surprising full, but I couldn't focus on any individual faces. They piled around me, trying to get in drinks, and I felt like a rock sticking out in the middle of a moving stream. I raised my glass to my mouth and drained the last of its contents. Hey Jack, you should go home buddy, the bartender said, leaning towards me out of the pool of mixing colors. Maybe one more and then I'll head out, I mumbled, raising my head to meet his gaze. His face swam before me and I closed one eye to stop it from moving. I think you're done buddy, come on. Go home to your family. I could feel darkness swirling around the edge of my vision. I snorted and the bartender shook his head. Hey, Jack, you want me to call you a cab? For some reason, I found this incredibly offensive and I shook my head violently. Uh, piss off. I'll be fine. My head felt like a bloated boulder. I dug into my pocket and pulled out some crumbled cash. I threw it on the bar and stumbled towards the door. I felt like I was walking through a movie scene that I wasn't supposed to be in. People were turning to stare at me and I was too drunk to register shame and I shoved some punk kid aside and pushed myself out the front door. The world rocked beneath my feet and I felt a sudden urge to vomit. I exhaled slowly and dragged my feet towards my car. I was in no state to drive. I gripped my teeth and checked my watch. It was after 10. Shit. I banged into my car, still looking at my watch, and let out an angry grunt. I ran my hands over the door until I found the handle and pulled it open. I didn't dare look at my phone and see how many missed calls I had. I sighed as I climbed into the driver's seat. I needed to rest for a moment, settle my head. Then I would drive home and apologize to my wife. I would wait to tell her about the layoffs that are coming. But first, I needed to sleep. I closed my eyes and darkness rushed me. Hey there, Slick. I pulled my eyes open. Blinding sunlight immediately forced them shut again. And I rubbed my face, trying to clear my mind. To my surprise, I felt alright. In fact, I felt fantastic. I opened my eyes again and sunbeams warmed my face. I was sitting in a sprawling green meadow. Birds chirped overhead and green grass rustled beneath me. A pleasant breeze chuckling through the air. I was sitting against a tree in a circular clearing with swaying forest that wrapped around a sparkling pond. It was breathtaking. For the first time in months, I felt peace settle in around me. The blue sky overhead was cloudless, and I closed my eyes as I raised my face to absorb the gentle sunlight. Beautiful, ain't it? I snapped out of my trance and shot a look over to my left where the sudden voice had come from. There was a man sitting against a tree, not five feet from where I sat. He was in his mid-forties and was wearing a tan suit, a silver watch on his wrist and his sports jacket wrinkled against the bark. His green eyes sparkled underneath the brim of a blue baseball cap. Where am I? I finally asked. The last thing I remember was passing out in my car, drunk off my ass. The man smiled to reveal perfect teeth. Uh, don't worry about that. Ain't no use in it. Just relax and enjoy all this. 
His accent added to the pleasing atmosphere, and I found myself comfortable around this stranger. My, my wife, I need to get back to her and my kids. I said without much conviction, it was just so impossibly gorgeous here. I knew that I needed to get home, but the overwhelming calm I felt made it hard to put action behind my words. They're not going nowhere, Slip, the man said, closing his eyes and taking a deep breath through his nose. Just take a load off and enjoy yourself. I leaned back against my tree and ran my hands through the blades of grass. The woods filled my head with a beautiful scent. A combination of dirt and fresh rain on wood. The pond before me glittered like a mirror, filled with diamonds, and I found myself smiling. Whatever this place was, I never wanted to leave. All my worries seemed so trivial here. The overbearing stress I had felt earlier was gone. By the way, I'm Russ, the man said suddenly from his spot. I turned and saw his eyes were still closed, but he had a small smile. I'm Jack, I answered, watching the silver fish jump from the surface of the pond to snatch a bug. The man chuckled. Oh, I know who you are, Slip. I cocked my head at him. Who? Who are you? What? What is this place? Russ adjusted the ball cap on his head before answering. I just told you, I'm Russ. And this, he spread his hands. This is just a little slice of peace, buddy. Ain't nothing more. Can I stay here? I asked. Russ snorted, but there was no malice in it. I'm afraid not, partner. That wouldn't be good. This place isn't meant for that. Not anymore. I raised an eyebrow. Not anymore. Before he could answer, a noise echoed in the forest around us. It was distant and low. A single deep note that crawled up the sky and fell upon us. It sounded like the beat of a great drum. Russ pulled his cap and sat a little straight. What was that? I asked him. As the sound faded, Russ looked at me, his eyes uneasy. That's why you can't stay here for very long. The drum sounded again, and again, and again. A constant beat that filled the woods with a single ominous note. And for some reason, it filled me with a creeping dread. Not good, Russ mumbled under his breath. What is it? I stressed, feeling uneasy. Russ stood up, brushing himself off. It's the whistling man. He's bad news, Slick. You don't want to be around if he shows up. I wasn't following anything he said, and it must have shown on my face because he raised his hands. Listen, you need to leave, he said as the drum slowly began to grow louder. Why? What's going to happen? Russ waved me off. Nothing good, Slick. I'll tell you that much. You can come back, but not when he's around. But where is here? I sputtered as Russ advanced on me. Before he could answer, the forest filled with a piercing cry, a sharp whistle that cut through the sky and echoed all around us. I slammed my hands over my ears as the deafening note danced across the sun rays and exploded across the meadow. As the wavering echo faded, another whistle followed. This time, lower, sort of haunting, that chilled me instantly. The drum was growing louder, and I thought I felt the earth shiver slightly beneath my feet. Russ turned to me, his eyes wide. Get out of here. Go! He shoved me backwards and I stumbled, tripping over my feet, and woke up gasping in my car. I immediately opened the door and vomited into the parking lot. A great gush of hot stomach bile and gurgling rum. Tears leaked from my bloodshot eyes as I sat up and wiped my mouth. My head was splitting and I was desperately thirsty. I looked at my watch and groaned. It was a little after midnight. 
I took a few seconds to collect myself, thinking back on what I had just experienced. What just happened? I could still hear the echoing shrill note of that whistle. Or did I? I ran my hands over my face, the consequences of my nighttime drinking churning my stomach again. How was I going to explain this to my family? What would I tell my wife? I know she was going to be furious. I suddenly wish I was back in the meadow. The serene peace it had offered upon arrival was intoxicating. No worries, no stress, no responsibilities. Just warm sun and beautiful, accepting nature. As I started my car, I made a mental choice. I would do anything to go back. And now, I thought I knew how to get there. The next two days were a waking hell, as expected. My wife was pissed. She wasn't a woman who yelled or threw things. I almost wish she was. Instead, she turned to ice, barely acknowledging my existence. I try to be extra active with the kids, even taking them out for ice cream. But still, that wasn't enough to get my wife too warm to me. It was the weekend and every minute seemed like a chore. On the outside, I was super dad, making sure to always wear a smile and engage my kids in conversation and playful fun. None of this made me and my wife closer, and I felt the thirst return to me with a vengeance. I still hadn't told her about the layoffs, and judging by her mood, I wasn't going to tell her until her fury had passed. When Sunday night rolled around and she still wasn't talking to me, that's when I decided that after work the following day, I would return to the bar and get shit-faced again. I needed to see if I could go back to that meadow. I needed it, in the worst kind of way. My own sanctuary, of peace. I knew it was the worst thing I could do, but the frustrations of the weekend pushed logic out of my frazzled mind. She didn't fully understand the stress and worry that I was going through. She didn't know the weight I carried every day. It wasn't her fault, but I expected her to cut me some slack. As I slid into bed that night, I licked my mouth and focused on tomorrow. The need was so great. I almost got up and left right there and then. What little reason I still possessed forced my eyes close instead, and I tried to summon the vision of the meadow. I could almost feel it, waiting for me right behind my eyes. If I focused hard enough, I thought I could smell the greenery swirling through the swaying forest. If I shut everything out, I thought I could hear the frogs croaking at the edge of the water. Was that Russ? I was sure I had just heard him speaking to me, but it was all just out of reach, for whatever reason. I couldn't quite access that special place. I needed a catalyst. And that's how I found myself slumped over the bar the following night. The day seemed like forever. The clock indifferent to my desperation. On the way to work that morning, I had stopped at the liquor store, but had managed to hold off. My boss didn't say anything to me, which I took as a good sign. My wife still wasn't talking to me barely looking my way as she got the kids ready for school. I had tried to give her a hug goodbye, but she brushed me off, saying something that she had to finish packing lunches. This sparked an anger in me, and I left the house, clamping my teeth shut so I wouldn't say anything stupid. I knew getting wasted tonight wasn't going to repair any teetering marriage, but I had been pushed to my limit. If she wasn't going to forgive me, then what was the point? Her morning coldness had cemented my resolve to go out tonight, and I barely felt any guilt. I justified it in my mind. As I pulled into the bar parking lot, I felt a cool blanket of relief sweep over me. This was where I could let go a little. This was where I didn't have to think about my issues. I tipped the glass to my mouth and sucked the rum off the ice cubes. I hadn't bothered mixing my drinks tonight, 
I had a destination in mind, and I wanted to get back there as soon as possible. Judging by the way the room swam, I was doing a pretty good job of it too. The bar was empty, and I was relieved for it. A quiet tune played from the retro jukebox in the corner, and I hummed along as I tapped the bar for another refill. The usual bartender was off tonight, Kenny, and I was grateful for it. He had a tendency to cut me off, and I didn't want that tonight. I smiled at the young lady, and I said thanks as she placed a fresh rum in front of me. I was trying my best to maintain my composure. I didn't want to stop drinking until I couldn't see. I drowned half the rum in one swig and felt it slam into my stomach like a derailed train. I burped behind my hand and felt my eyelids swell. I smacked the taste from my mouth and my tongue burned with alcohol. My thoughts had become hard to control. The alcohol filling my mind like a sinking ship. I had been here for three hours and I felt like if I tried to stand, there was no guarantee my legs would obey. I tipped the glass to my lips one last time and that was enough to cloud my vision with a heavy fog. Blackness pressed in on my slosh brain and I ran a hand over my face. It felt like there was a face over my face. I giggled at the thought but was suddenly overcome with sadness. I blinked a few times and decided it was time. I cashed out with a mumble thanks to the bartender and very carefully walked out to my car. The world rocked beneath my feet and the full moon was so bright I had to shut one eye against it. My head felt thick and every breath tasted like ice and spiced rum. I stumbled to my car and managed to get the door open before collapsing into the driver's seat. I rolled my head back and shut my eyes. A small smile on me. I waited for it to happen. Hey there, Slick. I opened my eyes and gentle sunlight lit my vision. Stunning greens and blues melted together to form breathtaking beauty and my senses filled with a peaceful meadow before me. I was back. The dense forest encircling this pocket of paradise swayed gently in the breeze. The leaves rustling together to form a serene soundtrack to the majesty of this hidden nature. The grass was soft beneath me like cool blades of emerald silk. I ran my hands through it and leaned comfortably against the tree I sat under. The pond before me was captivating in its stillness. A plate of shining silver. I turned and saw Russ sitting a few trees over. His tan suit jacket was bald behind his head and he leaned comfortably against it. I had to come back, I said. This place. I trailed off, trying to find the words. It's something special, ain't it? Russ grinned, crossing his feet in front of him. Yeah, you got that right. Silence passed between us and I sighed. My head empty of worries and was filled with complete tranquility. The secluded isolation adding to calming magic of the meadow and pleasant birdsong danced between the trees. Again, I was filled with the desire to never leave this place. Everything was just so perfect. It made life seem unfair in comparison. Why were things so hard? Why did misfortune and approaching despair plague my every day? Why couldn't I just stay here, away from all of that, and close my eyes in peace? This was all I needed. You know, Russ said from his spot, as much as I enjoy your company, I worry about you. I looked over at him. Why, why is that? Russ adjusted his baseball cap. You know why. Don't make me say it, Slick. Can you just let me enjoy the quiet? I said, shutting my eyes. Russ grinned. Of course. But I need you to know something. Before he could continue, a distant drum began to beat. I opened my eyes. Russ pointed out into the woods, towards the noise. That. What about it? I asked softly. 
Russ stared at me under the brim of his cap. That didn't used to be here. I nodded towards the distant drum. That? The drum? His green eyes bore into my skull. Not, Not just, just the drum. Him. I stared. Russ's voice dropped to a whisper. The, the whistling, whistling man. You can tell when he's around. When the drum starts. He's looking for you, Slip. And he's never gonna stop. I shifted uncomfortably. Who is he? What does he want? Russ stared out into the forest. Do you really have to ask? I suddenly threw my hands up in frustration. What are you talking about? Before he could respond, the air filled with a shrieking note. A long high whistle that bore into my head like a screaming drill. Swarms of birds erupted from the trees and took flight, escaping the sound. Russ jumped to his feet, with fear all over his face. You better scram, Slick. It sounds like he's close. I don't want to, I shouted, climbing to my feet. I don't care about him. I don't care what he wants. Anything is better than going back to, to out there. Jabbing my finger towards the sky, Russ approached me as the drum beat grew louder. Another whistle slicing through the meadow like a razor blade. It was the same low note as last time, but despite that, the thought of leaving made me want to weep. I had only just arrived. I couldn't leave yet. I couldn't face what awaited me on the other side. He doesn't have to be here, Russ said urgently. You have to get rid of him. It wasn't always like this. The drum was deafening at this point, and I felt the soil beneath my feet begin to tremble. Russ opened his mouth to speak. But then, a new voice erupted from inside the forest. A horrible, deep voice of rage. Jackie. Where are you, Jackie? Another series of long whistles followed, cracking the air like a bullwhip. The eyes of Russ went wide, and the blood drained from his face. He took a step and raised his hands to me. Go! Go! He shoved me, hard, and I went sprawling backwards, and woke. Nausea tossed my stomach, and I slammed the door open and emptied my gut onto the asphalt. I screamed, wiping my face and pounding on the steering wheel. No, no, I can't be here. Let me go back. Face once again with my looming, life-ruining problems filled me with absolute panic. The night air filled with indifferent moonlight, and I raised my eyes to the sky. I can't do this anymore. Russ, let me come back. I thought I could feel his presence, a tickle in the back of my head. I focused on it begging to be swept away to the calming meadow. I didn't care about this whistling man. I didn't care about what he wanted. I couldn't face my family right now. I didn't want to think about work or money. I just wanted to go back. Please, help me. Slamming my fist into the dashboard. Take me back, please. I sat there for a moment, trembling, bloodshot eyes catching focus on everything. Then, nothing. I wiped my face. You can't do this to me. You can't make me stay here. I checked my watch and saw that it is midnight. Last call wasn't for another hour and a half. I licked my lips and ran a hand through my hair. I felt like crap. I knew I probably looked like crap too, but that wasn't gonna stop me. I'm coming back, I said, stepping out of my car, avoiding the puddle of vomit, and I'm not gonna let you send me away this time. My legs wobbled as I carefully made my way back inside the bar. I steadied my breathing and summoned as much willpower as I could. It wasn't easy. My throat burned and my eyes were watering. The world rocked and swayed beneath me, and I gripped my teeth against it. I pushed the bar doors open and slowly made my way back to my stool. I motioned for the bartender and she returned to me. She told me she was surprised to see me back and I told her my car wasn't working. I told her a friend was coming to give me a lift, and I was just coming back in to kill some time. I spaced out my words and tried my best not to slur. I asked her if she could load me up a beer and a shot. She chewed her lip for a moment, and I could see her thinking. 
my intoxicated state apparent no matter how good an actor I thought I was. I reached into my pocket and slid her two twenties, tipping her a wink. The money shattered any moral disputes she had been fighting against, and she quickly cracked the top of a beer. She filled a shot glass and placed it in front of me, telling me to behave myself. I thanked her and assured her that I would. When she turned away, I slammed the shot, gasping at the sudden charge of heat. Whatever edge I had lost from vomiting returned as the rum hit my system. I snatched the beer up and sucked it down, with the last drop sliding onto my tongue. I felt sick, like a soaked sponge left on the counter. I looked around, the room moving and swaying, and saw there were only two other people. They were over in the corner, not paying attention. And to my delight, I saw them wave over to the bartender. It looked like they knew her. She shot a quick look at me and then went over to them. Heart racing, consciousness blinking. I quickly leaned and snatched the half full bottle of rum from the counter. I chanced to look over my shoulder and saw that my act had gone unnoticed. You can't get rid of me, I mumble, tipping the bottle to my mouth. You can't make me stay here. I closed my eyes and drank. I didn't stop until everything went dark. I gasped and opened my eyes. Soft clovers tickling my face. I breathed in and sighed, relief running through me. I got to my knees, pulling myself up and surveyed the meadow. Something was wrong. The sun was hidden behind thick gray clouds a blanket of dark cotton. I craned my neck and was met with nothing but silent gloom. The woods were quiet, the usual chorus of birds and bugs, absent. I could hear my heart hammering in my chest, a rush of beating blood in my ears. I looked to my left, scanning the tree line, and suddenly felt sick as my eyes focused on the scene before me, a deep fear sparking in my chest. The forest was ripped in half, leaving a dark corridor of splinter ruin. It looked like a train had exploded through the woods, obliterating everything in its path. Fractured trees and uprooted underbrush spilled out into the clearing, the remains of nature. What is going on? I whispered, voice tainted with fear. I suddenly spotted something in the pond, floating on the surface. And as I squinted to try and make out what it was, my eyes went wide and panic foamed in my throat. No, I cried, charging towards the water's edge. I splashed into the shadows at full speed, tripping and then pulling myself up. I shoved lily pads aside and sloshed deeper, the horror before me, gaining clarity. Russ, I said, reaching out for his motionless body. The water was up to my waist as I grabbed at him, pulling him up from under. He was dead weight in my arms, his head rolling against my chest as I dragged him toward shore. Come on, come on Russ, I begged, gritting my teeth, heart racing, muscles groaning. His eyes were closed and he didn't move. I finally got us onto the grass where we collapsed in a rush of weight and water. I struggled to regain my breath as I got to my knees and flipped Russ over on his back. My heart sank. His face was a mess of cuts and dark bruises. His clothes were a tangled jumble of torn fabric, brushing strands of wet hair from his face. Who did this to you, Russ? I felt like I already knew the answer. I shifted myself over him, fighting panic. I placed my hands over his chest and began CPR. Please, wake up, I begged, pumping his chest. Please, you have to wake up. Don't do this, Russ, please. I leaned down and blew into his mouth, tears starting to leak from my eyes. I felt helpless, alone, and filled with overwhelming despair. Why did everything always have to go to shit? Why did I always end up making things worse? Why couldn't I escape the never-ending stream of misfortune? Please, I said, now beating on Russ's chest. Please, don't do this. Suddenly, in a rush of urgency, the eyes of Russ snapped open and he vomited up a great gout upon water. He coughed and sputtered 
empty in his stomach as his body convulsed. I leaned back on my knees, unable to believe it. Relief swept over me, a cackle escaping my lips. You're... you're alive, I cried, gripping the shoulder of Russ as he wiped his mouth and lay on his back. Russ kept his eyes shut, his voice terribly weak. Hey, hey, Slick. You just can't seem to stay awake, can you? What happened to you? Why is everything different? Russ touched his face before answering. He found me. He found me with you already gone. And he didn't like that. Who? Who did? I knew the answer. I jerked my head to the woods, the sound of the drum robbing my attention. No, not now, please. Russ, broken and defeated, said, He's coming back to finish the job. And if you're here, he's going to get you. The drum was getting loud. I leaned down and grabbed the arm of Russ. What does he want? Why is he doing this? Russ closed one eye and looked painfully at me with the other one. He's not doing this, Jack. You are. My body went cold and I said nothing with my throat going dry. Suddenly, a long rising whistle rose from the forest. First high, then dipping low. The notes bounced off the dark clouds and echoed across the meadow, filling me with dread. Russ tried to sit up, grasping at my arm. You can't keep doing this, he said, desperation filling his voice. You can't keep coming here like this. He's gonna kill you. My lips tremble and I look down at Russ. Um, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I put my hands over my face, sobbing. Jesus, what have I done? Jackie. The voice cracked through the air like a clap of thunder, and my heart tripped into my rib cage, crippling fear spreading across my chest. Another shrieking whistle, a sharp drill in my ears, boring into my skull. The ground shook beneath my feet, and I suddenly heard the exploding wood and crashing underbrush from the forest. The sound was distant, but approaching the meadow at a tremendous speed. The whistling man, I whispered. I stood up and faced the tree line. Sweat coated my spine with cold fear, and I licked my mouth with my face pale. Don't let him get you, slip, Russ said from the ground. Tears ran down my cheeks. I closed my eyes as the drum and constant whistle blasted around me. I could hear trees crashing to the earth as the whistling man rocketed towards me from the woods. I felt helpless and terrified, a lone man against a tsunami of power and devastation. The whistling man exploded from the tree line and into the meadow. Immediately, everything went silent. My heart counted the seconds against my chest. I squeezed my eyelids shut even tighter. I suddenly felt the presence of someone standing directly in front of me, hot breath on my face. I've been looking for you, Jackie, something said, inches from my face. I kept my eyes firmly shut. My knees were shaking, and I felt my bladder release in a rush of terror. My lips quivered, and tears dripped down my chin. Go away, I croaked, my voice a dry rasp. I felt a heavy hand rest on my shoulder, followed by a low chuckle. Ah, uh, Jack, why would you want that? You brought me here. I shook my head, squeezing my eyes shut even tighter. No, not anymore. A hand gripped my chin. Look at me. Open your eyes. Look at what you created. Please, I sobbed, spittle spraying. Just leave me alone. Open your eyes, Jackie. Weeping, I slowly pried my bloodshot eyes open and the breath rushed from my lungs in a haunting wave of horror. I was staring into my own face. The whistling man grinned as the recognition twisted my face with shock. You see, there ain't nothing to be afraid of. This is just who you are. I took a step back, shaking trembling. No, no, this isn't who I am. He chuckled and took a step closer. Yes, it is, Jack. 
I violently shook my head. No, no, I'm a good person. I'm nothing like you. The whistling man suddenly stepped ahead and grabbed me by the throat with his grip impossibly strong. Time we finally settled this, Jackie. Just leave me alone, I said as his grip tightened around my throat. He leaned into me, grinning, and squeezed darkness into my vision. It's over, Jack. Stars swam around me as the world began to fade. With one last gasp, I whisper, Please, just let me go home. Right as I was about to pass out, a blackness ate my eyes. The grip around my throat was removed. I gasped and fell to my knees, the metal rushing back into focus, color and clarity, realigned as I coughed and sputtered, clutching my aching throat. I looked up in a relieved confusion and my eyes went wide. Russ was holding the whistling man from behind, one arm wrapped around his throat in a chokehold. He had his other arm over the whistling man's face with his hand shoved inside his mouth, gripping his upper jaw with commanding strength. Sweat stood out on the face of Russ, his eyes two coals of burning fire. His voice crackled like a blazing furnace. He doesn't need you anymore. Leave him alone, goddammit. The whistling man growled around Russ's hand, fury shaking him. I am him. The neck muscles of Russ strained as he began to pull the whistling man's head backwards, howling with authority. Nah, any, more. Screaming with exhausted effort, Russ ripped the whistling man's head back between his shoulder blades in an explosion of blood and bone. I heard a sickening pop as his spine shattered, blood gushing from the now lifeless mouth. Gasping, Russ pulled his bloody hand from the whistling man's jaws and shoved the dead man to the ground. He looked at me, chest heaving. You okay, Slick? Shock rooted me to the ground, complete disbelief freezing me where I sat. Crying, I got into my feet and embraced him, weeping onto his chest. Russ stroked my hair and let me cry into him, his heart beating against my chest. Thank you so much. I wept. I'm so sorry. I'm so fucking sorry for doing this. Russ pulled me away and took me by the shoulders. You're a lot stronger than you think, Jack. Never forget that. I wiped tears from my face, unable to stop more from coming. I won't forget. I promise I won't. Thank you so much. Russ nodded. Now, are you ready to go back? I nodded, sniffling. Russ closed his eyes. Good luck to you, Slick. I'm proud of you. And with that, he pushed me backwards. And I awoke with a start on the bar floor. Faces were looking down at me, a blur of color and noise. I blinked and then everything rushed into focus. It was the bartender and the two men she had been talking to. Their faces were filled with concern and I realized they were talking to me. Hey, you okay? One of the men asked, getting down on one knee and helping me sit up. Relief washed over me in a suffocating wave as I gripped my teeth as my eyes filled with tears. I smiled up at the three of them, my head clear and focused, all traces of a hangover gone. Um, alright, thank you. I must have slipped in my stool and bumped my head is all. The bartender told me they had heard a crash and looked over to see me lying on the floor, unmoving. She said it had taken them a little bit to wake me, almost to the point of calling an ambulance. I assured them I was okay climbing to my feet and brushing myself off. My calm demeanor clearly confused them to the point of not pressing me further. I thanked them for their concern and told them I was going to call a cab and go home. After making sure I was really okay, they told me to take care of myself. That's when I smiled and said, I will. That was three years ago. It's been a long, hard road since that night, but I'm doing well. It took months for my wife to get over that horrific act of selfishness, but I have proven to her since then that I will never be that man again. I can't believe she didn't leave me, and it fills me with eternal gratitude. 
I spent this time proving to my family that they can rely on me. I have shown them my resolve and we've grown closer, making it through these horrible early months. But we're stronger now and life has begun to show promise of happiness. I did end up losing my job, but my boss was able to secure me another with a sister company. It was an act of kindness that I wasn't expecting and it furthered me down the path to positivity. It's taken three long years to rebuild my life and it's been three years since I had a drink. I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you it was easy because it wasn't. It was hard, impossibly hard, even after everything I went through. There were days I almost gave in to temptation, but I would open up to my wife during those times of weakness and she helped me through them. She gave me hope that I could change, but I had to face what I had become first. And I will never go back to being that man. I'll find my own way to the meadow. I know it's out there, waiting for me. The path to its peaceful serenity, growing more clear the longer I walk the road of recovery. And even though I come so far and made so much progress, I'm still filled with fear because I know he's out there waiting for me. He'll always be there, the whistling man. For a few months, I've been having a feral cat that comes to my back porch looking for food. I first saw him in October around 6 p.m. when the sun was going down and I had walked to the back door to take a smoke outside. I could see him through the double window that looks out onto the swamp beyond. He was sitting patiently as if he had been waiting for me. His black, greasy fur reflecting the colors of the sun. When he saw me approaching, he stepped closer to the window and stood on his two back legs and started to paw wildly at the window. I chuckled and walked back to my fridge, pulling out some leftover chicken breast from the night before. I grabbed an old plastic dish from the cabinet and I tore the chicken apart into bite-sized pieces. I returned to the back door. I opened it only enough for me to squeeze out so that he wouldn't bolt into the house. If he did, I knew I would regret it, letting him slip inside only to possibly infest my home with blood-sucking fleas and to tear up my furniture. I placed the dish down and he pranced towards it, scarfing it down like it was his first meal in weeks. I looked at him closer through his long fur and could see how thin he was. His legs looked like skin and bone and his cheeks looked sunk in causing his eyes to protrude out grossly it was then that i noticed his tar colored eyes that had no glint to them no shine from the setting sun it reminded me of those computer screens that don't reflect pesky sunlight glare coming from your window. I felt uneasy, worried now that he may attack me. However, he looked at me once and blinked slowly before racing down the porch stairs and disappearing into the wooded swamp. I started to wake up every morning only to see the dead corpse of some poor animal when I would take my routinely first smoke of the day. It started with little animals, birds, mice, and other small rodents. I always figured it was just the way that cat 
was thanking me for feeding him when he came, which was only a couple of times a week. Even though I only saw him a few times, there was always a dead animal on the porch step every morning. I thought it was silly that some old cat would bring me presents every morning. After about a month, the corpses began to get bigger. I was finding more bigger rats and the occasional possum. I started to think it was strange that this cat seemed to catch his dinner just fine, but still came to me for scraps. I always brushed it off though, seeing as it wasn't doing me any harm and I had no roommates who may have been disturbed by it. However, on one particular cold and foggy morning, I walked to the back deck to have my cigarette and I looked down to look for my present. There was nothing there. I could feel my heart flutter. I was worried that something may have happened to my little buddy. That feeling quickly left and I felt my stomach drop as I looked over the railing to see my lawn filled with bodies. I placed a hand over my mouth to catch my gasp. The sight was disgusting and a less than pleasant encounter when all I wanted was to enjoy a smoke. After that occurrence, the dead animal started to appear once again on the back deck. Part of me felt relieved that my cat was okay, while the other part of me felt like something was terribly off. Sometime in January, I woke up in the middle of the night, groggy as hell, but with a strong craving to have a smoke. I walked down the hall and paused at the window overlooking the backyard, and I saw a pale figure that reflected the moonlight. I paused and my eyes widened. Suddenly, I was no longer groggy and the urge to smoke disappeared. The figure looked up at me and I froze. My breathing stopped. I could see its sunken in eyes staring at me and its spine protruding from its pale skin that had patches of fur peppered. It looked very strange, almost human-like, hunched over while standing on two legs. I panicked and I could feel my body growing hot as my heart beat quickened. After staring at me a little longer, it turned around to crawl over the fence and then it walked away on its two legs. I went back to bed, completely terrified. I woke up the next morning and rubbed my eyes, releasing a big yawn. I thought to myself, what a crazy dream I had. I got up from bed and walked downstairs to make myself a pot of French press coffee. I grabbed my pack of smokes and my mug and walked out the back door. I walked to the rail with my mug and crossed my arms and leaned over. I instantly dropped my mug and could hear it shatter on the concrete below. Time felt like it had slowed as I looked around to see corpses lacerated and splayed across my yard. The black feral cat was strategically in the middle of all the dead bodies. No mercy was spared to any of those animals. I felt my stomach heave and I threw up what was left of my dinner from last night. I felt a chill run down my spine as I remembered what I had seen the night before and I no longer believed it was a dream. I quickly 
walked back to the door and locked it shut behind me. It felt surreal and I couldn't imagine that this was happening to me, but to my dismay, it was. I couldn't be bothered to clean all the bodies. I was too fearful to walk out that door. I stayed inside the house for the rest of the day on my computer, looking for solutions to my problem. Of course, I found nothing but nonsense about some beings called rakes, wendigos, and skinwalkers. I strongly felt that this was some person playing a massive prank on me, and I desperately wanted to believe that was the case. I fell asleep at the table in front of the back door. Being the light sleeper that I am, I woke up to a gentle but loud knock at the door, followed by a few more. I immediately sprang up and swiveled around. I pulled the blinds away from the door just enough to peer out the window. Nothing. I walked to the window beside the door and shrieked at what I saw before me. The creature I had just seen the night before had pressed its hands and face against the window and was breathing heavily with a wicked smile plastered against its face. I ran to the counter and snatched my keys, running out the front door to dash to my car. As I got in, I began backing out. That's when I saw the creature come around the side of the house, only to stop when it saw me backing away. It then stood up on its two legs and gave me a slow wave, showing off its nasty pointed teeth and its disgusting smile. I retreated to my sister's home, which was about 30 minutes away, and I busted through the front door with no explanation. She came running down the stairs with her boyfriend following close behind her. She flicked the lights on and could see how disturbed I looked. Taking me to the guest room downstairs, she told me I was welcome to stay as long as I needed. After refusing to tell her what went wrong, I felt crazy after what I saw. Part of me still believing it wasn't real and another part afraid she would think I was crazy. A few days passed and I was beginning to feel more at ease. My sister was making breakfast by the time I woke up and I nodded to her and her boyfriend as I sat down at the table when there was a ring at the doorbell. I went to go see who was there. As I saw my sister was busy and her boyfriend was enjoying a little small talk with her. I opened the door and was surprised to see no one was there. A putrid smell struck my nostrils. I looked down to see the half rotten body of my feral cat. Skinwalkers. Yeah, I grew up on the reservation and we just follow little rules at night to keep ourselves safe. They are real, 100%. My entire family has seen them. I have many native friends who have family members that are actually part of the Skinwalker community. I mean, I don't know how else to phrase it. Some of these rules are no whistling at night, don't say the name out loud. Don't leave windows open on a full moon. One time we had one claw and cry at the side of our house on a full moon. So this is a personal rule that not many other people follow. We also have restricted places we can go at night because they are Navajo worshiping grounds. 
And for anybody who isn't Navajo, there are places you cannot visit legally because of skinwalkers, religious practices, and sacred land masses. I do want to point out that, as a side note, most of the time they just look like normal people. They're not what the media makes them out to be. There are some non-native families living in our small town, and skinwalkers are just a normal part of their life. My mother actually cared for one in the nursing home who didn't fully transition, and there were rules that she had to follow. Some of them are smearing ash on their foreheads before entering the skinwalker's room, saying a Navajo sacred prayer, and never entering alone. There's also a few wild stories from her experience when it comes to physically caring for one, but it may be too long to add here. Now, most of them look like humans, but when it's not, it's a funky long creature that can take the form of anything with one abnormal thing attached to it, like a goat with seven legs or a dog without a nose. They want that flesh of yours. So here are more extra tips to survive them. Living in the reservation is like playing a game of what the hell was that noise every night. If someone begins to smell like their flesh is rotting, run. If someone wants to take you to the reservation, politely say no and just move to another city. Don't ever come back and pray. Pray to whoever you believe in. If you're not religious, pray to a random god, to anybody that comes to mind. Skinwalkers are demonic creatures. But if you're ever in the woods and you hear some whistling, this is a calling sign that the skinwalker is coming after you. Last Monday, I went on a walk into the woods. I go all the time, whether it's spring or winter. I'm 18 years old, I'm not very tall, and I don't weigh much. So I'm a pretty fast runner too. Sometimes, it can get really creepy out there in the woods. My mom and grandparents, they live right down the road by the way, always told me that if I start to feel unsafe out there, I always need to leave. They never said why, but I always figured they were afraid of the koi dogs, and it never seemed that important. I did listen to them though. So Monday afternoon, maybe a bit past 4 o'clock, I left to go walking. I had been out there just two days before with no issues, but after walking for about half a mile, the feeling that I was being watched began. I kept walking until I came to the old logging road. It makes for a quick way around the woods, and it also connects to the road that my house and my grandparents' house are on. I was getting pretty tired of hiking through the snow-covered bushes and logs. I still felt like something was watching me, and just a few moments before, I could have swore I saw something moving around from the corner of my eye. So I decided to walk down the logging road instead. As I was walking down it, I heard the sound of chains rattling nearby and started looking around for them. I was thinking maybe it was just chains in a tree blowing in the wind, but I couldn't find any chains and I stopped hearing it after a second. I kept walking and was getting close to my grandparents land when I heard the chains again. I stopped walking to look around me and to check to see if maybe it was something I was wearing. My jacket, my necklace, but it wasn't anything on me. I jumped around to double check and maybe looked really stupid, but I knew it wasn't me making the noise. I decided just to go to my grandparents house and walk back using the actual road. But as soon as I started heading into the woods, I heard something. It sounded like my own footsteps had been in time with a second pair that were maybe about 10 feet away. Which made no sense because there had been nothing there just a moment ago. I took another step and heard something step at the same time from behind me. I didn't turn around. I was too afraid. So I acted as if I was going to take another step. 
but I stopped my foot right above the snow. I wanted to make sure I wasn't going crazy. Behind me, whatever there was, stepped down. I heard the snow crunch, then it moved forward again, quickly. It must have known I figured out it was there. That's when I started running towards my grandparents' land, and whatever was behind me followed. It sounded humanish, and the sound of the chain started up again when it started chasing me. The thing definitely had only two legs, and it sounded pretty big. There's a lot of thorn bushes, small trees, and other things that stay around all year, even in the winter. When I ran between them as best as I could, it was just going right through them. I glanced behind me for a second, and all I saw was a really tall, gray, humanoid blur before I looked back in front of me. The final stretch was terrifying. I could hear heavy breathing and chains rattling just a few feet behind me the entire time, and it sounded like it was almost growling. My grandparents' dog was up in the yard near the house and started barking, but he didn't run towards me. He just stayed by the house barking. Then he ran with me to the house when I got close to him. I ran up the door and went inside. The dog came in right beside me, and I slammed the door shut. I didn't hear anything, and I looked out the window, but there wasn't anything there. The dog was leaning onto me and shaking. My grandfather came to the door from upstairs after just a few seconds, and I started crying and told him everything. He became very serious and told me, Don't think about it. Just forget it ever happened. I tried to ask him why, but he refused to tell me anything. I tried asking my grandmother too, but she didn't say anything. And she changed the subject. Before I begin, I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my Gammy and Gampy. At the end of my school years, I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course, the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes, and it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old and it lasted 
until I was about 11. As the years went by, it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong, even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and I already had the camping trailer attached to my gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. It was deep into the woods and far from other people as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me Sugar Booger. That being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I had heard. But it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Sugar Booger. I looked up where I heard it coming from, which was from the woods, but there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe, and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window, just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later. It was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side trying to fall back asleep until I heard sugar sugar. my eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut, like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six, I knew this wasn't normal. Then I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft, but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there, frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain, but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. 
I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard, and to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw. That if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again. But this time, it was my actual name. Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes where we heard it. Then to me, she then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something. But I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something. A red fox sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes. The same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods, no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside 
and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old. Her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there. But as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. My little brother was only nine at that time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it. But now they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was too scared to even blink. Then I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw, as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me, and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would have happened 
if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw. And then they started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions, and that's what really scares me. Now, I have long moved from California, and now live in Kentucky. I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else, and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, please help me. When I was 13, I was on an ATV with my two older sisters, one 15 and the other 18. We were going to my grandma's place, which was less than two kilometers away from my parents' place. We were traveling through our fields, but on the way, I suggested we go around the fence so we didn't have to open the gates. It was pretty much the same road, just a bit off to the side. As we get to the middle of the field, we all noticed something sitting on top of the hill we were about to climb. We slowed to a crawl because it looked human. We thought maybe it was an animal that had fell and was stuck. Or maybe it was my uncle who looked after the cattle. But this thing was sitting weird. Basically like how Spider-Man perches over buildings crouched down on top of a rock. I want to describe this thing. It was tall, skinny and was wearing nothing. Just the body is what we could see, grayish color, and the head wasn't shaped like a human's head. It was thin and small. We were about 30 to 40 meters from this thing, and it was during the day too. As we were sitting there trying to figure out what we were seeing, this thing slowly stood up and my heart sank. Its arms were long, very long. I screamed to stop and instantly jumped from the front of the ATV to the driver, replacing my sister. As we were switching, this thing started running at us, but it was running weird. Its arms were swaying back and forth like normal runner, but because of how long the arms were, it looked weird. You would think it would run on the long arms, but it didn't, and it was running fast. I turned around and shot off straight through the field. My sisters were screaming that it was still coming, but to be honest, I could not look back at this thing. So I just said, don't look at it. We rounded the corner, and that's the last we saw of it. As we got home, I crashed the ATV into the deck trying to get in as fast as we could. We were so scared my parents actually believed us. They called all the family to warn in case it was a trespasser. 
They said nobody saw anything or anyone in the fields after that. Alex, Jim, and I decided to go camping. We set up camp, decided to just drink and talk, and that's what we did all night. About anything and everything that came to mind. It was 3 a.m. and we were still chatting away until we heard something in the trees. Some kind of cracking sound. Could be a bird, said Jim. A big damn bird, I replied with slight confusion. Could be a monkey, joked Alex. We shared a laugh and ignored the sound and continued to talk. Another half hour had passed and the sound had completely stopped. I wonder what that was anyway, Alex said. Well, I have no clue, I replied, taking a sip of my beer. Well... I hope it's gone, because I need a piss, Jim said, standing up and heading to the trees. A few minutes passed, and Alex and I grew concerned. We best go look for him, said Alex. He sounded a little annoyed. We stood up and walked in the direction Jim went. It didn't take long to find the first drop of blood and then the trail that led deeper into the woods. What the fuck? I said, shaking. We began shouting for him, following the trail. I was the first to see him, standing in a clearing about 10 meters away. He was facing away from us. We tried shouting, but we got no response. We walked closer and we noticed him twitching violently. He was covered in blood and clearly beat up. I was about to say his name once again, but the word got stuck in my throat when I saw the bloody pile of meat on the floor next to him. I think Alex saw it too as he also went silent. As if by magic, Jim turned to us and we saw his face was literally hanging off and underneath was pale gray skin. We could also see a burning orange eye and part of a wide mouth with long sharp teeth where the skin was peeled off. Besides from this, Jim looked normal aside from a few cuts and bruises. As we stared into the single orange eye, the thing wearing Jim's skin pushed the peeling flesh back on, and there, Jim stood totally normal. Hey guys, let's go for a walk, he said in his normal voice. This thing also seemed to demonstrate excitement. Alex and I turned. We ran past our campsite and got straight in the car parked about a mile from our tent. I'm not sure if this Jim followed us. I swear I could hear thumping footsteps behind Alex and I. We reached the car and jumped in, pouring sweat and heaving. I started the car faster than ever before and drove at nearly 100 miles per hour all the way back home. When we arrived and got out, I walked around the back of the car only to see scratch marks on the bumper. I shivered as I realized how close he must have been. This was over 40 years ago. Alex never quite recovered and last I heard he was living in a mental hospital. I was thinking I may have to join him as I'm pretty sure I saw Jim a few weeks ago at a bar. I thought I was mad until I did some research. I would have done it sooner, but I'm an old man now, and we didn't have Google back in the day. I'm pretty sure we encountered a skinwalker, and it may have found me after 40 years, and I think it wants to finish the job. And now, 
it's pretty strange that I keep getting letters asking to catch up from my old friend, Jim.